Five years ago, I made a big video on Steven Universe and haven't stopped having a migraine since. The thing is, like everything ever made, it hasn't aged well. Ask any artist that they like looking at their old work. Time, context, the fact that Steven Universe is over now, and five years of growth as a person and critic as reflected poorly on that old video. I have in many instances tried to update it to more modern standards with better critique, which none of you terminally outraged motherfuckers bothered to watch. So when I see people still passing it around trying to refute it, I feel like I'm locked in a time loop where a video I made while I was dealing with severe abuse and was therefore constantly angry is being held up as if it reflects everything about me today. And the truth is, my opinion on Steven Universe has changed quite a bit. In truth, I was honestly taking out my anger at many other things in my own personal life onto something that flat out cannot be hurt. In recent years, I've taken a much kinder view of Steven Universe almost entirely because it's interesting to talk about. Let me make this clear, I do not think the show is good. My feelings on it today can be summed up as, Oh yes, I hate this. It is revolting. More? Please. Steven Universe is a lot of things, but boring isn't one of them. And years afterwards, I was dealing with trying to wring analytical content out of shows that all go bad in the same boring, predictable ways to the point I just got so tired of it. That's why I don't like adventure fantasy as a concept. They're all the same, and you try coming up with a new script every two weeks to describe Adventure Time times 12. But Steven Universe fails in very fascinating ways if you want to dig into it. It's practically become a critical muse. Let me make this clear, I would love nothing more than to sit down with someone who really likes this show and thinks it's brilliant and pick their brain, because I am fascinated by that notion. The problem is, nobody does it. Most of the rebuttals to that old video are less about arguing why Steven Universe is good, and more about being outraged at the sheer audacity of suggesting otherwise. There have been a half a dozen videos trying to debunk the old video, and honestly, I haven't watched a single one of them. I would definitely watch a Steven Universe's Genius and Here's Why, because I find that position fascinating. But let's go through this five-year-old video and debunk it is exactly the kind of combative mudslinging that's just fucking boring. It's not 2018 anymore, I don't want to fight you in the Denny's parking lot over you Tenna fanfiction. You! Shut up! Yes, sir. You! Keep talking. Part of critical analysis is having to compare where something missteps to when it doesn't. That's where criticism becomes fun. Nothing is truly 100% bad, except conservative politics, and that contrast between its successes and failures is where criticism really shines. But nobody's talking about where Steven Universe succeeds. So, I guess I'll have to do it myself. Steven Universe is interesting to talk about precisely because it's writing bounds between being great and great piles of shit. There's a reason everybody says it could have been great, because after multiple episodes where characters do nothing, don't advance the plot, and don't advance their own character, and you're about ready to write the show off completely, they throw something like Bubbled at you. Bubbled is one of the best episodes of the entire show. The premise is that Steven was ejected into space last episode, and he's protecting himself from the vacuum with his defensive bubble, and it's just him and one of the Ruby soldiers and all they can do is talk, and so that's exactly what they do. It's a quiet episode with a lot of really discordant music that does a lot to sell just how big and empty space is. How even if you managed to survive, you'd be adrift. You'd be completely and utterly alone forever. And Steven's trapped with someone who wants him dead and doesn't know it yet. Not only is this the first time Steven hasn't been able to talk someone down, he's also on his own, and rescue isn't coming anytime soon. After things come to a head and Steven has to ditch Eyeball, there's nothing left to do but just float there in the empty void of space, completely and utterly alone. It only lasts about 30 seconds before he's rescued by the others, but it's 30 seconds of the best visual storytelling Steven Universe has ever done. I honestly think it would have been a lot better without Eyeball. To have Steven do his usual, I'm not paying attention to the danger I'm in shtick, and have it slowly reach the crescendo of that last moment as the reality that he is alone adrift and can't get back fully settles in on him. Really deconstructs Steven's tendency to goof off in tense situations. There really is no better way to have a character reflect on their decisions and their choices in life than to just set them adrift in space. But for what it is, Bubbled is a good exploration of the concept, and one of the few times where everyone from the animators to the writers, well, they're the same thing, to the musicians, bringing their A-game. Then the next episode is an extended Roadrunner homage. Then the next episode is a game show montage where Steven and Amethyst are shown to suffer from self-worth issues through the vector of a game show. Then the next episode is a lore dump. Then the next episode is bad. This pattern of really good episodes then leading into an anime-inspired lore dump has confirmed what I believed for a while. The biggest problem with the show's writing is that everyone involved can make really good character drama, it's just that they would rather make anime references. So many of the good moments in this show are just when characters have to stop bounding around in 
badly animated fight scenes, or weird drug trip sequences, or crying speeches about redemption and friendship, and talk like normal people. But these moments are few and far between, especially when you have an edict from on high mandating near-constant peanut gallery. It's been complained about before, but Steven has this rather unusual trait, where Steven has to actually be present for an event in order for it to happen. So if you thought you could have a moment between Garnet and Pearl as they both talk about losing someone important to them, you can't get that because the show has to contrive a way for Steven to be there. And if he's there, he has to be the center of attention. There's an episode where Amethyst is excited for a rock concert, but when Greg bails on her, Pearl offers to drive instead, and then drags Steven along as well. The episode is interesting because most of it is dedicated to Pearl getting a crush on a woman who looks a lot like Rose, and it's probably the best episode primarily featuring Pearl living her life and moving forward with it. But it's brought down by the fact that Steven has to be there making glib remarks the entire time. As much as I loathe the notion of critiquing an episode by wishing it was a different episode entirely, if this were a solo Pearl episode, it'd be great. Pearl goes on a quiet road trip during the night, thinking about everything, resolving to move forward with her life, coming home a renewed person. Sometimes you just gotta go take a drive in the dark somewhere quiet to think about everything. Hey, the stuff with Amethyst going to her concert is just a framing device to get Pearl in a car and talking to buff Imowen anyway. You could do this the whole episode with no dialogue, just the car radio and some sound effects. Someone driving in a car at night is a surprisingly somber atmosphere. It's a shame a lot of shows don't use it. But because we're not allowed to do anything without including Steven, instead the episode has to deal with his commentary the entire time. Okay, nobody's gonna say it. She kinda looked like mom. You noticed, I noticed, we all noticed. Yes, Steven, we noticed. Now please shut the fuck up. This is a really good, quiet moment where Pearl can just think and you can soak in the visual storytelling they presumably care so much about, but no, Steven has to open his fucking mouth. And the worst part is that this is not something the show has to do. Fans argue, well, he's the main character, but lots of shows have main characters. They still take time to give other people a moment in the spotlight. But if this were a show just about him, that would be fine, but oftentimes the show has episodes focusing on other people and what they think and feel, and the writers have to awkwardly shove Steven in there for it to happen. And once he's there, everything just proceeds like a normal show. It's like a fucking Kingdom Hearts cutscene where things play out as they did in the source material, but Sora, Donald, and Goofy are just there in the background. This is the biggest contributor for why the story is often so rushed and slapdash. In a normal show, it will often cut away to the villain so you can actually know what they're doing and thinking. Or sometimes side characters will have their time in the spotlight. It's an essential part of storytelling that has pretty much been the standard for films and television since they figured out you could cut film and stick bits of it together and it just works. But here, it just doesn't happen because Steven isn't there to see it happen. Yellow and Blue Diamond have a very sudden switch in the final arc where it turns out that they've been questioning Homeworld's fascist dictatorship for a long time. Would have been nice to have seen that at all, but Steven was too busy hanging out with Onion for 20 episodes. So many characters have issues and trauma that they have to work through but can't because Steven has to be there or they aren't allowed to. If Steven doesn't bother to check up on them, you never learn about them at all. Getting back to Last One Out of Beach City, that episode episode ends with Pearl getting a girl's number and showing some sign of moving on with her life. This is never followed up on, and this girl, who is only known as Mystery Girl by the Phantom, never appears again. This is a recurring problem, and honestly, removing Steven's perspective from the equation wouldn't actually solve it, because the real problem at play is that the crew doesn't care. They let Pearl hook up with a cute buff lady, but they didn't want to revisit it because they just didn't care. They'd rather do six episodes about Sadie's band. So many characters, often main characters, are left critically underdeveloped because the writers are too busy making joke episodes and callbacks to other shows they like. As much as we can blame the For Steven perspective, it's ultimately the showrunner who decides what the show is going to be about. Peridot is one of the few crystal gems to have a really interesting character entirely because a lot of time is spent with her. You get to see this transition from a blue collar technician trying to check on a super weapon to someone who has come to love life and everything in it. And it only happens with a ton of episodes of focus, something most of the other characters just flat out don't get. Peridot is the only character who gets to have scenes where Steven isn't present. Granted, the entire premise of the episode is Steven listening to her tape recorder, but fuck it, I'll take a half-assed approach to telling a story like a normal person. This is the only time you get to see characters interact with each other without Steven's running commentary. Hell, she spends most of it interacting with Garnet, another character who desperately needed some real screen time. God, Jesse Zook did not deserve the shit this show's garbage fandom gave them. This is what happens when you spend time with a character and do more than
more than one thing with them. Peridot becomes such an interesting character because you see so many different avenues of her explored. Homeworld's fascist dictatorship means she has to unlearn fascist propaganda, understand fusion, learn to love living beyond just being a cog in the machine. It's so good and she becomes visibly happier as a result. And she's the only one who gets this. They had so many ideas for Peridot and they were like, let's do all of them. I would have loved to see that kind of passion, dedication, and care given to the entire main cast. It's actually quite surprising just how little time is spent on the main characters. Go back over most episodes and keep a tally of how many are actually about a main character and how many do anything substantial with them that opens a new avenue for them or moves their arc forward. Most episodes are actually about some rando in Beach City who are usually one note joke characters and the ones that are actually about the main cast usually just rehashes something they've already done. Even Steven, oh I remember that show, the character who is legally mandated to always be on screen at all times is criminally underdeveloped. Name five things about Steven that aren't compassion, trauma, fat, savior complex, or Connie. What does he like? What keeps him going every day? How does he actually feel about the other gems? What does he want to do when he grows up? So much time with Steven spent watching him fix other people's problems like he's the fucking messiah. The most interesting thing they can do with him is have him crack under the stress? So what are you gonna do? Shatter me? Go ahead! Just do it! No! Even if we don't agree, nobody deserves this! But even when that story ends, he just moves away and the show ends waiting to be renewed again so we can all experience the second coming of Steven. So much of the show is a pantomime that looks like it's doing something with the characters, but how they feel about anything is often left decidedly vague. Steven doesn't really get his own story. His entire story is cleaning up the mess left by his deadbeat mom, and so most of the time spent with him that isn't him dicking around is just learning more secrets about his birth mom. That's great for the people who make theory videos and like speculating, there's no shortage of mysteries to solve and content to mill, especially given the fact that most of them are just never gonna be answered, so you'll never be wrong. But it's all mystery and no payoff, because at the end it's just, well, I guess that's a whole lot of stuff we now know. Getting back to Pearl, I find her story is most emblematic of this unwillingness to take a step forward, because Pearl has a lot of time spent with her, but it's all time spent recycling the same story, that being Pearl's grief over losing the love of her life. Now, the nature of Pearl's is weird, it's very clearly chattel slavery, but Becky often denies that, so it's clear this wasn't intended, but that's not a very complicated topic. Becky's not very smart, tried to do one thing, smashed her face into a wall, whatever, I get it. I have a more interesting point to make, so I'm just gonna take Becky at her word that this wasn't what it was supposed to be. I am gonna play this clip again, though. Still, having said that, I feel guilty. Okay, I'm good, let's go. So the thing about Pearl is that her story never gets to move forward. Pearl is where Becky wears her Revolutionary Girl Utena jacket the most, and the thing about Revolutionary Girl Utena is that it didn't really end in a way that gave anyone closure. At the end, Utena gets lost in the realm of darkness and Anthe goes off looking for her, and they're never seen again until a few more corporate acquisitions puts them in the next Kingdom Hearts game. So when that's your inspiration, your story is already kinda doomed to never come to a satisfying conclusion, because melancholy grief is kinda all the show has going for it. There is an interesting theme in there about how you can't save someone from abuse by emulating the system that abused them in the first place, but it's buried under symbolism and knives. It runs a gauntlet of serious subjects that could have all served an entire show on their own, but here they're all haphazardly thrown into Darling Baby's trough, and most people only remember the show for being gay and covering heavy topics at all, and not about how well it does. Hell, most of the topics people claim it covers aren't actually in the show, it's in Adolescence of Utena, basically a movie rewrite that came out later. This is why any show inspired by Utena tends to have the same problems of just just not grappling with cause and effect and cycling through serious issues without actually taking them seriously. Because nobody who watches Utena as an adult sees a revolutionary step forward in gay rep and anime. What they see is a fucking mess. But if you were a gay 13 year old back in the 90s, this show and bootleg copies of Sailor Moon were all you had. And so you'd covet those things and never really think critically about them. This is why Steven Universe thought nothing about taking a story regarding dysfunctional family dynamics and just throwing Nazis on top of it. Because Utena does the same thing. 
thing. Take a story about abuse and then layer cosmic stakes on top of it until you've forgotten why you're here. Some people call this show psychedelic, and yeah, it does often feel like it was written on drugs. I will say it's the perfect show for anyone who ever wanted to see Iris shank Misty in the back with a fucking rapier. That's just quality television right there. It certainly is an experience, but if you asked me to find a model for writing stories about abuse or gay relationships, this would not be a show I would tell you to emulate. It already does way more than its writer is capable of handling, and a fan of that is not going to improve on it in any way. So what you end up with is almost revolutionary girl Utena fan fiction, and you have to remember that Utena was already Princess Knight fan fiction, and after a certain point, you're just inbreeding. It's why you have all those American-made shows about kids going to anime warrior school, and the fact that there's such a thing as anime warrior school is just never questioned, because a show they liked had it and also Harry Potter. Uh, speaking of Harry Potter, uh, Pearl's entire story is about how she's still hung up on her first crush who has died a tragic death and is coping, or rather sabotaging her own mental health by spending the rest of her existence watching over the son she had with someone else. So there's a cursed thought for you. So Pearl's story keeps running that treadmill because where else is it going to go? They wanted it to be like Utena, but because Utena had an open ending, you're kind of stuck with it. Now that's fine for Utena because it only had 40 episodes and it's serialized. Steven Universe has 180. That's certainly a long time to do fuck all. The crew is aware of this too because they spend a lot of time distracting the viewer with shiny baubles, particularly musical numbers. When people try to point to this story being done well, they usually point to Mr. Greg because Pearl sings about how Rose chose Greg over her. and it's certainly loud and epic and climactic as Pearl does her best impression of a Kingdom Hearts character, but it's hollow and empty. It's using a musical number to sort of yada yada over the fact that you're watching Pearl do this song and dance, literally, for the 10th goddamn time. No, the actually good episode about this is Rose's Scabbard. This is the first time Pearl has had to confront the fact that Pink kept secrets from her. Pearl thought she knew everything about Pink. She thought she was the only one who truly knew her, regardless of anything else, like the fact that Pink chose Greg over her, the fact that she gave up her life to have a little son of Geode. Pearl at least had the fact that she was the one person Pink shared everything with, her only real confidant. Well, it turns out she doesn't even have that. Pink kept secrets from her too, and it causes her to completely break down. This is probably the only episode that's even better in hindsight. Steven Universe likes to pretend it's weaving this intricate plot web, but like most stories, they're making it up as they go along, but presumably Rose had a secret identity was scribbled on a post-it note somewhere, and this is the only place where it feels like they thought about that. Anyway, the reason this episode is so good is because when Steven finally chases Pearl down, Pearl just talks, mostly to herself, and we get her processing her feelings out loud. And one thing we really learn here is that Pearl hasn't really accepted that Pink is really gone. She openly wonders if Steven has her memories. Pearl really is aimless and adrift, alone for the first time in her life. She doesn't know what to do. Remember what I said about how the show never let it's a quiet moment sit? Well, here it does. Sometimes I wonder if she can see me through your eyes. What would she think of me now? Well, I think you're pretty great. This moment is absolutely beautiful. It's one of the most gut-wrenching moments I have ever seen in a cartoon, and it didn't need a big flashy dance number, fight scene, or death trap to do it. It didn't need a celebrity cameo or a guest animator to do it. All it needed was a writer who knew what the fuck they were doing. Sorry, did I say knew what the fuck they were doing? I meant decided to actually put in some work that day. I've said this the whole time, Becky can make great art when she's not getting distracted by anime references and her fucking giggle squee. This is what Rose's story was missing for most of the show. We don't need to necessarily know who Rose is, we just need to know someone who did, and Pearl got a lot of screen time, but screen time in Steven Universe doesn't equate to development. Between Rose's scabbard and volleyball, Pearl's grief is usually wallpapered over with musical numbers. This really comes to a head in the bad version of Rose's scabbard, volleyball. During this episode, while trying to heal Pink Pearl's scar, always a silly notion, scars don't actually heal, Pearl takes the two of them to the reef to try and repair her. But it turns out that the scar on her face isn't an injury. It's from an injury that was so impactful that it manifested as a part of her physical form. So it's a scar. This does have a good moment where Pink Pearl says she's fine and her scar spreads to immediately contradict her. <laughs> oh, she's just like me. Okay, I said that as a joke, but like, during the writing of this video, I actually did make another appointment with my therapist and unpack the fact that the only positive relationship I had as a child was a lie, and was actually quite abusive, and that's partly why I'm so bad at having relationships with people. So if a moment like this ever makes you go, oh, she just like me for real, just, just stop and think about that for a minute.
Okay, let's continue. Okay, so Pearl assumes it was white, but when Pink Pearl corrects her and says it was pink, Pearl goes into full denial because this is a pink diamond Pearl never knew. A childish brat who threw destructive tantrums and kept breaking her toys. It's an interesting moment where both of them have to confront the fact that at some point, Pink Diamond changed from explosive and angry to reclusive and secretive. Or at least it would be if Steven didn't throw a tantrum and accidentally trap them both in a lobotomy clam, and so now they have to have the really short version of that scene from Rose's Scabbard before quickly fusing into another Utena reference and having a rushed action scene. My god, you were almost there! We could have had another scene like that one in Rose's Scabbard. There's an exchange in the clam that would have been so good if it was longer and quieter, but the fucking showrunner is a fucking chipmunk with a sugar high. It's like getting the Cliff Notes version of a much longer, more focused story. That moment where Volleyball asks Pearl how she stopped hurting and Pearl just says, I didn't, is really good. Because the thing about trauma is that it never really leaves you. You can manage it and recover, but it affects everything about you. Pearl's time with Pink are her formative years, and they're called formative years for a reason. They stick with you and influence everything you are as a person for good or ill. Childhood or early life trauma will always stick with you far more than adult trauma will because your brain has grown and developed around it. It affects the really deep-seated aspects of your personality. And that's interesting. Let's really dig into it. Dissect Pearl's brain in as many ways as you possibly can. Early seasons were pretty good at this, like when Connie asked Pearl to teach her to fight and Pearl taught her to be a meat shield because that's basically how she understands being a soldier. That's interesting. It shows how her relationship with Pink has affected her thought processes everywhere. But almost every instance after that, it just reminds you, oh hey, Pearl's crush is dead. Pearl's not over it. I'll remind you again in an hour. Pearl's grief and how she deals with it and how it affects her day-to-day -day thinking is interesting. But you know what else would be interesting? Seeing what Pearl gets up to when she's not being reminded about how she got cucked by the lead guitarist of a fog hat cover band. Like, I don't know, an episode where she warps to Brazil and learns capoeira and takes part in a competition and has sapphic tension with her opponent in the finals. I mean, you like anime so much, do a sapphic tournament arc, that'd be fun. I'm not asking for her to get over it, I'm asking to see her make some progress because that's satisfying. I want to get to the next episode where it's time to open the grief box again and think, you know what? She's been doing pretty good for herself. I'm proud of her. It's not enough to just tell me what happened off screen. Let's see it. I'm kind of reminded of how Legend of Korra just kind of glossed over Korra learning the four elements on the basis that the previous show was already about that. But the point that it misses entirely is that the adventure to learn about the four elements isn't just about learning the elements. It's about the avatar broadening her horizons and meeting people from diverse backgrounds and learning to really appreciate every culture on the planet. Not holding up in a compound completely isolated from other people and perspectives. This is why Sozin and Roku grew apart. Sozin remained isolated and that's how imperialism festers. Roku traveled the world and so of course he's not on board with Sozin taking over the world in the name of the Fire Nation because the world is already beautiful and you'd know that if you stepped outside your walled garden. The interesting part of a story is seeing how characters grow as people. You shouldn't just skip over that and jump right to the end. Oh, but Lily, you still get it so that means it's good the way it is. Oh, by that logic, why even bother anime? it, just tweet your outline and then make a Tumblr blog where you talk about your OCs and never write anything. The execution of a story is the fun part. Getting off Pearl for a second and getting onto Pink Diamond, I always found it a little skeezy the way the show spends so much time analyzing every single bad thing Pink Diamond ever did, because Pink Diamond's crimes are fucking minuscule compared to the rest of the diamonds. You get these big elaborate musical numbers about every horrible thing Pink Diamond ever did, like all two of them, and it's such a point of drama and weight for like half the show, but then the actual tyrannical oppressors show up and they're basically just silly little aunts? To say Becky's priorities are out of whack would be an understatement to end all understatements, but on reflection I noticed this in other places too. One of the themes of the show is that none of the gems are perfect parents, but Steven still forgives them because he loves them, right? Well, when you look at the number of times the gems mess up, a trend pops up. Pearl and Amethyst mess up their parenting and traumatize Steven the most, while Garnet, Ruby, and Sapphire mess up like twice. However, the two times Garnet messes up are also one of the few times in the show Steven responds with anger at the way he's being treated. When Garnet accidentally scares Steven by teaching him what future vision is, he gets angry even though he was the one that doubled down. When Ruby and Sapphire act a mess in public, Steven yells at them. When Pearl almost lets Steven fall to his death, when Pearl brainwashes Connie to be Steven's warrior slave, when Pearl almost gets herself and Steven killed by flying in a DIY spaceship, when Pearl invades Garnet's boundaries, when Pearl does anything, Steven starts jumping to hugging it out. It's pretty fucked up. Now, the Watsonian critique could suggest that Steven is just accustomed to Pearl being nuttier than rat crap at a pistachio factory, while Garnet can usually be counted on to be the actual adult in the room. But the real critique is another one of priorities. The writers are determined to get you to sympathize with Pearl, and so when she fucks up, it's you 
usually excused or swept under the rug. I don't think you need to do that, though. A, a character may be sympathetic and still held accountable for their actions. You're not gonna tarnish Pearl in the eyes of the fanbase if Garnet or Greg have to give her an earful every once in a while. Or you might, the fanbase has rocks for brains after all. The crew seems very afraid of criticizing Pearl at all, and so they do everything in their power to blunt all of her actions, and that usually means Steven forgiving her. Steven is the show's moral center, and if he approves of something, the fanbase usually will too. In fact, it's a common deflection tactic of the Diamond's Redemption arc because people will say, oh, they weren't redeemed because Steven hasn't forgiven them? Which always struck me as a strange argument because Steven isn't one of their victims. It's not up to him. Look, just, just stop taking shortcuts. Unpack Pearl's behavior. People will get it. It's almost like there's this fear people will condemn Pearl at the first opportunity, but people don't usually do that unless they're bigoted or it's immediately clear that this character is your baby. And look, I've got no stones to throw in this regard. I'm a writer myself. I have characters for whom I go, that's my baby. They have never done anything wrong in their life. But you don't have to be afraid of people not being on board with it. Here's a dirty secret that I've known for years. People will get on board with any idea if you tell a good story and tell it well. If it takes you a while, people are fine with that. You don't have to preemptively try and counter internet grumbling. Let them grumble. There's always the risk that after a bad episode, your Twitter mentions are going to be flooded, but honestly, I think showrunners should just not have Twitter anyway. That's just bad for you. And Pearl is one of those characters who is never going to have a good first impression. You watch the first two seasons, and you won't get the feeling that this is someone who was toyed with and played for a fool. You'll get the feeling this is someone who can't take no for an answer. You'll probably wonder if this was Rose's creepy stalker. That's the vibe I got from Pearl for a long time. But you know what? That's fine. More information came out and I was like, yeah, alright, I'm on board. However, I do think Pearl's story, and indeed many character stories, take way too long to get to the fucking point. You don't need this much setup, you don't need this much filler, you don't need any filler. I have no idea why so many Beach City episodes are in the- actually, no, that's a lie, I do know. See, back in the 80s and 90s, most action-adventure anime were made as adaptations of comic books, but for some boneheadedly stupid reason, the decision to adapt a comic into an anime was made exactly 0.4 seconds after the first issue hit shelves. So a lot of these shows end up catching up to the comic book and needing to fill time with filler seasons while the writer made more story to adapt. The thing is, Japanese comic books are usually written and drawn by one guy, and so for the longer, more elaborate shows, those filler arcs were getting pretty common. Now, the reason they're called filler is because nothing happens. Any character development is forgotten when they get back to the real story, and nothing in them has any weight. This is what filler actually means. It's, it is a nothing burger plot to stall for time. I don't know why fandom got it into their head that filler means character episodes that don't advance the plot, but that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Now, the thing about this business model is that it was the worst fucking business model anyone has ever thought of since trickle-down economics. If there was ever a distillation of the worst of the worst of dystopian nightmare capitalism, it would be the anime and manga industry. Crunch is rampant, animators are underpaid, comic writers even more so, and a few companies are exploiting people en masse. Anime filler arcs are not a cute, funny thing, they are an exact symptom of what happens when one person can't create infinitely, but the money men demand constant, constant profit. Weebs have a hard time accepting any criticism of the anime industry, it's so emotionally devastating to them, they've been trying to spin it into xenophobia for the last 15 years. So Steven Universe, a show made by weebs, didn't really think anything of filling the story with filler episodes that do nothing. Um, actually, Lily, Rebecca said that every episode is important, and there is no filler. I'm sure she believes that. But then you get something like Steven and the Stevens, which is supposed to explain how time travel works, but then they never use time travel again. All of this waffling has real effects. The last arc of the show before it was cancelled was cut horrendously short, and it didn't need to be if they had just gotten to it a lot quicker. See, Cartoon Network wanted Ruby and Sapphire's wedding to be the last episode of the show, and for a show all about love and finding happiness and purpose in life, that's actually a really cool idea. It wouldn't fix the sidelining Ruby, Sapphire, and Garnet all had throughout the show, but it'd be a pretty neat denouement. Allegedly, and I say allegedly because I honestly just don't believe a single word that comes out of Becky's mouth, she had to really fight to get a few more episodes to finish the story. But the solution there could have just been to flip them around, have the wedding after the end of the show, after all that shit with the diamond. These negotiations presumably took place in 2018, it was possible. And if you did it well, it'd be beautiful because you're having the wedding after healing the crystal gems. That would be 
Mwah, storytelling. But by the time you came around to figure most of this stuff out, the show had already backed itself into a corner by clogging itself with way too many episodes about Mayor Dewey, Lars, Sadie, and Ronaldo. And at the end of the day, any show has to end at some point. Cartoon Network was never going to let this show keep limping along forever, and that's not even a problem unique to Steven Universe. Multiple shows have hamstrung themselves by just twiddling their thumbs with a looming deadline on the horizon. Perception is what makes this difficult to explain, because Steven Universe on the surface looks like a slow burn with a rushed ending. But the rushed ending is just the consequences. Time you waste on garbage now is time you won't have on important things later. Even good cartoons get three or four seasons at most. Look, I'm sorry, but you're not One Piece. You're not gonna get 500 episodes to start the process, to begin the preliminary evaluation, to decide if you're eligible for permission to embark on the first leg of your journey, and Steven Universe was already long as sin. It had 180 episodes. You know how many episodes All in the Family had? 205. And that's the most beloved sitcom in the fucking world. Revolutionary Girl Utena, the show Becky cribs most of her ideas from, had 40 episodes, and it managed to tell a coherent st- It managed to tell a complete story. It managed to actually end in a way that was satisf- It actually managed to end! By the way, episodes in Steam Universe are more like 11 minutes. That's like half of what shows usually are. Isn't it more like- 90 episodes? Well, Bonnie, congratulations on figuring out your division. Thank you. And to answer your question, every episode still has a complete three-act structure, so their runtime is irrelevant. Oh, I see. Carry on. There we go. Lack of focus is the show's big problem. Wherever the crew is writing a story, they're getting distracted with random vignettes, anime references, and trying to cram Becky's latest musical number into it somewhere like a Monty Oum fight. It's clear, on an executive level at least, that one or both of the showrunners saw this as their magnum opus, and thus needed to cram everything into it they possibly could. Any idea they might have had that could serve as its own single season spin-off or miniseries was just thrown into Steven Universe as an aside. Most of the criticism towards Steven Universe often gets deflected by blaming Cartoon Network, and I think that belies the real issue. On some level, Becky was convinced this was the only chance she would get. Despite having worked in the industry for some time, even working with superstar producers like Gendy Tartakovsky, so not only was every idea shoved in there, everything was compromised to such an absurd degree. Ironically, it was Steven Universe that gave me a brand new appreciation for Lauren Faust, who for a while became rather notorious for bailing on projects after creative differences with the executives. And I respect that. I respect just going, you don't want me to make the show I wanted to make, then I won't make the show. But honestly, I don't think creative freedom would have solved anything, because just on a fundamental level, the way she writes and thinks is flawed. The answer to any lore question about Steven Universe is, it depends. Why? Because the answer changes every week. Are fusions composite identities, or are they their own identities greater than the sum of their parts? It depends. They are one where they need to be, and the other at all other times, and there is no consistency. Is fusion a metaphor for relationships, intimacy, sex, friendship, symbiosis, combat team-ups, the concept that mashing characters together is cool, tax evasion? The answer is yes. Now, fusion as a concept is not unique. It was found in anime for years, and the style that Steven Universe uses is taken from both Dragon Ball Z and Kingdom Hearts. But in those, it's not really emblematic of anything other than the power of friendship taken to its logical extreme. In Steven Universe, because Becky's kind of pretentious, fusion is a... well, it's not a metaphor, it's a simile. A metaphor is something, a simile is like something. It's basically unity and working in sync. There's a lot of ways to do that, and admittedly, despite insistence from the fandom otherwise, the show has never really pretended that isn't the case. You've got the very intimate kind of fusion with Garnet, but then you have Steven and Amethyst bro to fight bad guys. Any idea that it's strictly about intimacy or relationships is thrown out the window when Jasper fuses with a complete stranger and a beast. Fusions are presumed to not last if the people involved aren't in sync, but Lapis kept Jasper at the bottom of the ocean for months tormenting her for giggles. Then in the very last episode, Steven is just fusing with gems that aren't even active. Which honestly, are you allowed to do that? That feels like it should be a crime. The truth of the matter is that showing off new fusions is eye-grabbing, but building up to them consistently is difficult, so they just don't bother. Any notion of fusion having some kind of meaning is abandoned by the writers pretty damn fast. But you know what? That's fine, because that was a problem that they already solved. Fusion is given its intimate weight through permafusion. Garnet and later Rodenite are permanently fused because they are in love. Because of this, they're actually very in sync because they're accustomed to being fused all the time, and they don't like not being fused because they've been together so long that being apart creates a very deafening solitude. A lot of people might hate the idea of sharing a mind with someone, but to someone who has already been sharing a mind for a very long time, being a complete individual could be just as nightmare 
nightmarish. This isn't a new concept. In Star Trek, most Borg drones who become separated from the Collective are very distressed when it happens. They don't like the silence, and permafusion is that, but like, not evil. To the writer's credit, permafusion isn't something they pull out lightly. There's only six permafusions in the entire show, and only two of them have significant speaking roles. So it's not like they're throwing permafusions out like Pokemon cards. The one we spend the most time with is Garnet, and we learn very quickly how much actual weight she puts onto fusion. When Pearl deceives her to form Sardonyx without her informed consent, real actual thing she did by the way, she's enraged. When she discovered the artificial fusions Homeworld was creating, she's horrified to the point of tears. When Peridot explains what the cluster is, Garnet actively calls it an abomination. This is usually the part where I tell you how they fuck it up, but no, this is one of the few things they remain consistent on. They remain so consistent on it, in fact, that they actually use it to interesting effect. See, because Garnet is the only adult in Steven's life who isn't fucking crazy, she becomes his model for good relationships, which means Steven, ever determined to take the shortest route to any destination possible, proposes to Connie and says that they should be Stevani permanently. This is disturbing to Connie, who has lived with actual real parents and friends, and so places a lot of value on individuality, so she obviously turns him down. They're also children, so legally they can't marry, and morally they shouldn't. It shows, probably for the first time, that other people have experiences that are different from Steven, and the things he's been taught to value are not the things they've been taught to value. Future is the only time Steven's role as moral center of the show is scrubbed away, and he has to confront the fact that people will say no to him, and he's just gonna have to live with that. There's also a PTSD plot, but it sucks. So yeah, permafusion and the weight and implications behind it are actually really well done, and Kruniver sticks to it. Unfortunately, that solid foundation turns out to be a cockroach in the coffee maker when we get to the Sardonyx arc. In the Sardonyx arc, Pearl and Garnet form Sardonyx to destroy Peridot's beak into Homeworld with more grace and agility than Sugalite previously had. But then Pearl starts repairing it to have an excuse to fuse more often. No idea why it didn't occur to her to just ask, but then again, you can set your watch to Pearl being completely fucking irrational. She gets caught, and Garnet is rightly furious, leading to an episode where Ruby and Sapphire can't agree on what to do about it. This is all interesting character work so far, as we now have to contrast the fact that Sapphire uses her precognition to avoid addressing issues in the here and now, and Ruby can't see the future, so she thinks Sapphire doesn't care. When they get home, all Garnet says is, not now. This is good, because it puts the arc to bed in a way where we can pick it back up whenever we like, and deal with it when everyone involved has clearer heads. We could do that, but you remember how Pearl and Pink Pearl had to have a rapid-fire therapy session inside the Mind Break Clam, and all it really did was emphasize how averse to quiet moments Kruniverse is? Well, Pearl and Garnet get stuck in a trash compactor and have to very quickly work out their shit and fuse before they can get out. Furthermore, this confrontation is largely Pearl just asking for forgiveness and then making excuses about how she couldn't help herself, which is something a rapist would say in court. Pearl wanted to fuse with Garnet because Garnet's so strong and put together and stoic and independent and she wanted to be strong too. But Garnet says, hey, uh, this idea that I'm some stoic, strong, always-together person who doesn't need emotional support is a load of horse shit. This is one of the first times Garnet has admitted to having doubts and insecurities outside of being the stoic one. So, when do we get to see more of this side of her, Becky? Good job. It's unfortunately also soured by the fact that Garnet is now consoling the person who assaulted her. Why? Why is she doing this? Why are Pearl's feelings being given more weight than the person she hurt? Well, unfortunately, this is how a lot of stories treat black women, especially in relation to their white co-leads. Garnet's feelings aren't prioritized because the writers overwhelmingly favor Pearl, and this is a story where Pearl is undeniably, unequivocally in the wrong, and as we've explored, Kruniverse is just unwilling to stick to that. Also due to the fact that the show doesn't really want to explore any kind of conflict resolution other than forgiveness, which naturally puts the responsibility for ending a conflict on the victim over the perpetrator, but the problems with that are magnified when your dainty white ballerina violently assaults a black woman and all she has to say for herself is, I couldn't help it, you're just so strong and alluring. It's not good enough to have characters of color in your show if you're going to so thoroughly torment them like this. And that's what happened to Garnet. They had a few good ideas and then threw her aside only to drag her out to either give exposition about fusion, violate her, or perv on her. So the one time they really had to think about the weight they put on permafusion, and they are ultimately sabotaged by their own primary theme and their unwillingness to let Pearl be in the wrong without caveats and their own racism. And I'm not gonna soften that one. The shit they pull with Garnet in this show, from violating her for the drama, to waving her around like a pinup, to just not letting her have character depth, is morally, ethically, spiritually, physically, positively, absolutely, undeniably, and reliably racist. It's not the only instance of Steven Universe being racist, but it's the only one I'm gonna cover for this video. This is what I mean when I say that full creative freedom won't make a better show, because the fundamentals of how to work with symbolism, and just how to resolve some pretty cut and dry conflicts, are are things that Kruniverse has consistently struggled with. The diamonds are the worst for this. The Great Diamond Authority is supposed
supposed to be some dysfunctional family. Controlling mom, golden child, other siblings, tantrum throwing out of control child, everything breaks apart, yada yada, your Tamagotchi is sad. But the Diamonds are also the cosmic dictators of an intergalactic fascist empire that spans most of the galaxy and whose victims are numerous enough that they're incubating in the Earth's core in a lethal combination of mass grave and weapons of mass destruction. You know, I feel like these two aspects of the Diamonds are not really going to gel together. This is one of those instances where you have a good foundation for an interesting story. I mean, my parents are in space and I'm estranged from them isn't a bad one. The progress of Steven learning that Rose wasn't stuck there but hid of her own volition would be interesting. But for some unknown reason, the stakes are artificially inflated so fucking high. So it's not just my parents are in space and I'm estranged from them, it's my parents are in space and I'm estranged from them and that estrangement has a body count in the trillions, also Earth will blow up if we don't make up and become a family. So the thing about estranged family is you're not really required to become unestranged. You can just stay estranged. At time of making the old video, I was estranged from all of my immediate relatives, and at the time of making this one, I'm tentatively on sociable terms with three of them, and the fourth I would like to forget ever existed, but I did that at my own pace. Crewniverse really doesn't like the idea of disowning family and making a new one, so the story is filled with 17 different traps so that Pink Diamond pretty much has no choice but to make nice with her controlling family, and actively refusing to do so is routinely characterized as a selfish decision, because that's what happens when you give family drama a body count. Understandably, most people don't like this story because it's gross. It's astounding just how much has to be taken out of the character's hands, and how high the stakes have to be, and how much the story has to railroad itself entirely because not reuniting with the rest of the diamonds is just instantly, the moment you even think about it, the rational, correct, and healthy decision to make. It's like all those shows that try to make civil rights groups into villains, including Steven Universe itself, funnily enough, and they have to do so much work to make you not side with them. What did Bismuth want to do? Kill three dictators and liberate Homeworld. You wouldn't know that if you talked to the fanbase. The fanbase seems convinced he was a blood knight who wanted to murder all Homeworld gems, but I've gone over Bismuth's episode with a fine tooth comb, and the fanbase just fucking made that up. Furthermore, the show ties all of its metaphysics into the diamonds. Without the diamonds, they can't make new gems, they can't fix old gems, and the gems are doomed to erode out of existence. I'm gonna coin a new term and call this coercive world building. Any reasonable person would go, this bitch fascist, and kick White Diamond out of a fucking window. And in response, Becky goes, uh, 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 well, uh, um, you can't because, uh, uh, the goop that G makes the gems comes from the diamonds, and, 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 uh, also the diamonds are the only ones who can heal the gems, so, 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 so you can't kill them or you'll doom the gems to go extinct, so, like, do better. Now, that's one way to go about fostering reconciliation of an estranged family. Another option is to have literally anyone involved actually interested in said reconciliation, but your idea is good, too. Because that's the thing, nobody cares at all. Blue Diamond is grieving, but she's not doing anything. Yellow is just going to blow up the planet and wash her hands of it. White Diamond is too busy trying to hunt down and exterminate Homeworld's underground jewels, and every version of Pink Diamond looks at the other diamonds with complete and total contempt. Even outside that immediate family, so to speak, the diamonds are completely hated. Even after their redemption, not a single character has a kind thing to say about them. Nobody in the cast wanted this reconciliation, so why did we do this? This isn't even a thematic issue. Making the characters involved invested in the thing you want them to do is like writing 101. We go from Steven going, we're family, we have to be family, and then one episode later it's like, oh these fucking guys again. He was so invested in this reconciliation and then he just gave up, seemingly off screen. Well we know why, the Diamond's Redemption was the single most contentious thing the show ever did. You spend the entire show being told, yep, they're evil, they're oppressive, they do genocide, they hate non-standard relationships, they don't respect people's identities, all the people they want to exterminate are branded with stars. And then suddenly the show just fucking 180s and goes OMG like cringe aunties. It's clear at some point Redeem the Villains was written on a post-it note somewhere and they just never went back to think about that. If you're going to do that, if you're going to go this is a show about forgiveness and redemption, then fine. Just dial back the stakes, you hyperactive weirdo. This is the problem with writing on presumption. Steven Universe came out in the heyday of villain redemptions and it hasn't aged very well, but this isn't a new observation. Villain redemptions were so overused in the 2010s, it's being deconstructed, or reconstructed, and villains who are just like, I'm gonna take over the world because I fucking can, are practically refreshing in comparison. What do you have to gain by killing her? Her. If I wanted to kill her, I'd beat her to death with a frozen lamb chop and then eat it with a nice Merlot. Even just on a fundamental level, if you have multiple villains and you redeem all of them, that's just 
boring. Steven Universe is only notable because villain redemptions always had that one line they would never cross, usually by just not including them. But Steven Universe did it. They jumped that line and they never lived it down, so I don't feel compelled to rub the show's nose in it any further. Even fans, blind idiot stands notwithstanding, will say this story completely fucking sucks. So the discussion is pretty much over and no amount of defensive entries on TV Trope's common knowledge segment will change that. All over the show, on a thematic level, you see the same problem that affects the plot and characters. Most of their ideas suffer from distractions and the ramping up of stakes for absolutely no reason, and the fact that they don't think about how these stories should conclude and brute force them to all conclude the same way. There's a good way to do the Sardonyx arc, but for the good of everyone involved, it requires removing the part where Pearl violates someone's bodily autonomy. Maybe replace it with... Oh, and I'm just spitballing here, a quiet conversation where characters are emotionally vulnerable with each other as they talk about insecurities and weaknesses and strength. You know, the part where Steven Universe really shines and don't get interrupted by a death trap. Ironically, the best episodes of this show are either when characters are just sitting and talking or the ones that are just this high concept mood piece. It works when it's being two and a half gems or tree of life, but when it's trying to be this genre smorgasbord of bad anime from the 80s, that's when it falls over. So many of the show's strangest moments seem like they were made entirely to be more like Utena, but ironically they forget the one thing that made Utena worth watching at least once in spite of the drugged up nonsense. For those who haven't seen it, and I'm giving you the very basic version here, Utena is a story about a girl getting wrapped into a dueling tournament where the prize is an actual human person being sold off like cattle. And when she discovers that this girl is basically a slave, resolves to win specifically to free her. She wasn't even in the competition to win this girl, she just wanted to fight. But ultimately she fails and Anthony has to be the one to free herself by actually wanting to believe that things could be better, and in the end she walks away and goes to find her maybe dead, maybe missing fiancé. The thing is, the undercurrent of the show comes to a head in the penultimate episode where Utena professes she's going to win Anthe so nobody can hurt her, but Anthe has heard this line before. This is still ultimately someone trying to control her, however well-meaning they may be, and she is likely setting herself up for more abuse. Concluding that the devil you know is better than the devil you don't, she stabs Utena in the back. Literally. Utena got it into her head that she could beat the villain at their own game, and it ultimately got her killed because it eroded the trust Anthe had in her. Utena might have had good intentions, but Anthe doesn't know that. This is not a system designed for benevolence, it's meant for power, and the victims of that system will not believe you when you say you're going to be benevolent with it. It's only when Utena approaches Anthe as an equal and a companion that Anthe's hope for something better returns to her. This is actually a very basic through line for a lot of thematic and socio-political issues. This is the core fallacy behind, say, police reform. The police as they exist as a concept was designed to protect the interests of wealthy landowners. In the US, they were literally just slave catchers. Trying to reform them is like trying to repurpose a gun into a bandage. Now, if that's the theme you took from Utena, that's a great foundation to inspire a story, and it can inspire any story you could possibly imagine. But it seems like what Becky took from Utena was abused ballerina sword lesbian, which is keeping in line with how the fandom tends to remember any given work. There's a lot in Steven Universe about revolutionizing the world, but in Utena that was a red herring for the villains, and Steven Universe doesn't do anything with the idea other than Steven giving a magical feel better speech. There's almost that theme in there with Steven being really pacifist, but instead of talking about the use of systems created specifically for power and domination being inherently harmful, it just goes wah, violence, bad, which in terms of insightful and profound themes is like waxing a car with a dog turd. To its credit, Utena never explicitly makes this theme, it just kinda sits there with it and expects you to get it, which is probably why we're in this mess. It's filtering Utena through the lens of early adolescent nostalgia, so about half the themes are either being filtered out or interpreted in rather simple ways. If you don't get distance from a piece of art before revisiting it, you tend to keep your childhood interpretation of it. And looking at how that interpretation manifests, it seems like what Becky took from it was a lot of surface level visuals. I've spoken with other people who like this show, and the consensus between us was that if Utena was a primary inspiration, Becky at most only half got it. But that's not a criticism. I'm not criticizing Becky here, it's just more of a neutral statement of fact. And as I came to that conclusion, I actually found a lot of value in Steven Universe, but maybe not in the way the creator intended. Let's see, how do I put this? So I'm a writer myself, both personally as I work on my own hobbies, and professionally through this channel and ghostwriting on the side. I've been writing stories since I was 14, and the main piece of original fiction I've been working on the last few years is called Scars, a story set in the 90s about two people who have been as close as they can possibly be since they were kids, contrasting their very different lived experiences. The the primary theme, like with most of my work, is love. How love is the universal need, and how it's what keeps people going in bleak or even dreary circumstances. It's a very quiet story, it's, it's almost mundane. The thing is, when I talk about it, people ask me what my inspiration is, 
and they're very confused when I look them dead in the eye and say Kingdom Hearts. That throws people for a loop because they know Kingdom Hearts as that anime game with Mickey Mouse in it where Donald kills a Power Ranger with a Dragon Ball laser. And if I were still 13, I'd have the same reaction. But as an adult replaying these games and seeing the series conclude its primary story, I didn't so much take the ballerina sword fighting or the big expansive anime plot from it. I took the story about the love Sora has for his friends and how it not only gives him strength but protects him. How many characters are built to be puppets of the main antagonist and go on this emotionally grueling journey to discover their own identities. How holding love close to your heart can keep you going even if you feel like you're completely alone. These are themes that the creator always had on his mind, and playing these games as a child, a particularly lonely child at that, that really resonated with me even if I didn't realize it. It's only playing them as an adult I was consciously aware of them, and those concepts are universal. As I mentioned, there is this interesting theme in Utena about how oppressive systems cannot be weaponized for good. They are designed to resist you doing that. Utena was never going to save Anthe by being the one to own her instead of her brother. A gilded cage is still a cage. And while you can get that theme as an adult by, like, reading the works of Asada Shakur, you can also get it from Lord of the Rings. You cannot wield it. None of us can. The One Ring answers to Sauron alone. It has no other master. But taking a work on its most visceral, emotional surface level isn't something exclusive to Becky. They're just the most elaborate about it. Fandoms are filled with people who simultaneously adore a given work of art, and yet wildly miss the point of it. Look at how many fans of Fallout or Baldur's Gate see those games as just sandboxes. So much so that both franchises' third entries ended up being watered-down, toothless versions of themselves. So you go from an entire game about resisting the pull of an evil god hell-bent on using you as a cosmic soul jar, to a game where you are encouraged encouraged at all times to literally shove worms in your brain. This is where nature versus nurture got us, apparently. And I've been seeing this approach to old works a lot, works that borrow surface-level features from something the creator really liked, but lacking the narrative or thematic weight. And that's really the core issue of Steven Universe. It has a lot of big ideas, but its understanding of those ideas is through the lens of a nostalgic 13-year-old, grasping at surface-level readings and not understanding why they work. The part where Anthe betrays Utena carries a lot of thematic weight to it. It's where Anthe is lost hope and chosen the devil she knows over the unknown that is increasingly looking bleak. It speaks to the way those in abusive situations will often refuse to leave because the unknown is frightening and they think they've already adapted to their own situation. Everyone develops ways to cope with abuse, and the hardest part of recovering is when you don't need those strategies anymore. I coped with severe abuse as a child by learning to bite first, to be such a problem, such a disturbance that it wasn't worth it to antagonize me. This had the downside of opening myself to reactive abuse, but in my damaged mind, it was worth it. I also bit at perfectly nice people who just wanted to be my friend because I was afraid they would hurt me too. Better to cut things off now than wait to be fucked with. The hardest part of recovering in my adulthood was learning I didn't need to do that. I didn't need to keep a sheet of glass between me and everyone else. I needed to believe things could be better. And for a very long time, I thought I was perfectly fine being completely alone for the rest of my life. Then I met my friends, and I, I met my wife, and it was like stepping out into the sun for the first time. And it was in that moment I realized I never wanted to be alone again. I've come a long way since those days. I don't let a lot of people in, but I utterly cherish the ones I do let in. It's a much better place to be. So this moment resonates with me in particular. For all my criticisms of Utena, I think this is truly wonderful. How does Steven Universe pay homage to what is arguably the biggest moment in the entire series? It's about waiting carefully for the perfect moment to cross. Uh -huh. <gasps> Whoopsie Daisy! You know, not to hit below the belt or anything, but if I had written a story like Utena, and this was how presumably the biggest fan of my work chose to pay homage to the single heaviest moment in the story where all the themes at play finally settle in on the viewer, I would take that as the most damning indictment of my entire career. Look, I'm quite critical of Utena, but I can't think of anything harsher to say about it than some of its fans do when they pay homage to it. I've been pulling my punches on my critique of this show to avoid letting things get too aggressive like the last one, but this... This is fucking pathetic. If you just skipped to this segment here, then hi, how are you? Having a good day? I think there's a fundamental difference between being wrong about something and your opinion and analysis changing over time. That's the folly of having one video become way more popular than all your other videos. Most people just won't see the newer stuff. Over the years, Steven Universe has become something of a critical muse. I talk about cartoons for a living. It's not a glamorous job, but then neither is yours. And one problem I've had over the last few years is that shows that are interesting to talk about and shows that actually pull in the views don't really overlap. If you 
want to pay your rent, you have to talk about the latest story-driven adventure fantasy show, and they're all so samey and boring that there's just nothing really to talk about. Steven Universe, at least, has a lot of things to unpack. It's fascinating to do that. I could sit here and look at episodes that work and compare and contrast them to episodes that don't for hours upon hours upon hours hours if I wanted to. And I do want to, but I understand when a video has gotten too long. I still think the show is pretty bad, but it's bad in fascinating ways that I could spend so much time going through. But I am going to take this segment to talk about things from the old video that I would gouge out with a rusty spoon if I could. For one, the tone. The video is very aggressive and personal, and some get the indication I think sugar killed my family or something. Uh, funnily enough, uh, people blame this on like some kind of Machiavellian agenda. This actually wasn't unique to this video. Most of the videos I made in 2017 and 2018 were quite angry. This is just the only one most of you have seen. Uh, I was being severely abused by my partner at the time, and it made me an unpleasant person to be around. No excuse for that. I wasn't in a good place mentally, and I'm in a better place mentally now, and I'm with someone else who makes me very happy. While I don't think Sugar is a talented creator, I would apologize for the sheer barrage of personal attacks if I could. I was taking out my anger at many other things onto this project that I'd been working on for a while, and like I said, every video was like, this. I was just taking out my anger on everything else, and that was obscenely wrong of me. <laughs> Not gonna sugarcoat it, obscenely wrong. Uh, for two, Stevani. I was way too harsh on Stevani. At the time, Steven Universe was the only place you could get NB rep in animation, and the fact that it sucked certainly didn't help, but since then we've actually had non-binary rep get better and worse at the same time, so Steven Universe is just in this weird middle ground. Compared to Double Trouble, Stevani is practically merciful. I think Steg probably really, uh, tempered my opinion on Stevani. It, it's kind of clear that the imagination for other fusion designs just wasn't really there for any of Steven's fusions with other humans. They both look like they came right out of Becky's spank bank, honestly. Smoky Quartz and Rainbow Quartz were just a lot better, uh, but my criticisms of them crossed the line into outright mb at times, and I apologize for that. In general, non-binary characters are characters I've always found very interesting. The sheer breadth of experiences and presentations and identities can be very creative, and it always bothered me that for a long time, designers either went full non-human or stayed strictly femme. I said it poorly in the last video, but non-binary characters are an unexplored frontier of character design, and so few people really run with it. I'm so happy we eventually got Rain Whispers. Uh, this is something Steven Universe actually themselves improved upon later with Shep, who isn't in the show very much, but in terms of characterization and design is great. One major problem with non-binary characters is... <laughs> Sorry. Did I say major problem with non-binary I meant one major problem with how people write non-binary characters is a lot of people on the internet view non-binary as just woman light, and so there's far more femme-leaning and femme-presenting non-binary characters than there are androgynous or mask-leaning. And that's assuming they bother at all, because the non-binary shapeshifter is becoming far too commonplace. For all my criticisms of the Owl House, I love how they have two very well-written non-binary characters who each have different gender presentation, and neither of them is the shapeshifter. For three, the entire racism segment. I've said this in about 17 different places before. I think the racism in Steven Universe warrants full analysis, and I've been working on a script doing just that for a while. It's generally something I tinker with in between projects, but the language I used for that segment was beyond inappropriate, mostly taking it from an article I sourced. Some of the words coming out of my mouth in there were flat out disgusting, and they weren't mine to use. No excuse for that. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, that new script I fully intend to pass by a sensitivity reader when it's done, because in 2023, I just don't trust myself with anything anymore. Four, four. Uh, despite common opinion, I never actually called uh, Sugar a Nazi. Uh, what I did was question whether the show's fixation on redeeming space Nazis from the moon was malice or stupidity, and I've always concluded that it's stupidity. I concluded that in the video itself, but I think I did hang on that issue far too long. I actually rewrote that entire section two years ago, and I think it's just way better. It talks about how the show's commitment to redemption at any cost ends up being very unintentionally cruel to abuse survivors. Look, I'm an abuse survivor myself, and one thing I will never be on board with is some dickhead telling me I need to forgive for my own sake. I've been abused quite severely uh, throughout my life and uh, by a lot of people, and I've made peace with some of them, and I haven't made peace with others, and one, I would dig my memories of them out of my head with a rusty screwdriver and forget they ever existed if I could, and nowhere in that path of recovery did anyone insisting I needed to forgive ever do anything but piss me off. A lot of abuse survivors are gaslit into believing that being angry will make them a monster, and you will never convince me that this is a good thing to teach people, especially children. I will always be firmly against that very concept, especially in children's animation. 
level fives. I would delete the entire animation segment. Even when that video went up, I wasn't entirely on board with it. I know behind the scenes, a lot of pre-production work just wasn't done and the animators were working overtime, also writing the story. And the only reason projects do that is because writers are unionized and animators aren't. So when your storyboarders are writing the episodes, you can pay them less. All the excuses about visual storytelling, complete horseshit. Shows with scripts and writers do visual storytelling all the time, and Steven Universe's claim to visual storytelling is pretty weak. And honestly, that deserved to have way more focus than the fact that the characters aren't on model, because that shit's a symptom, and a symptom nobody would care about if the writing was better. I only included it in the first place because it was a really big point of contention for SU cred at the time, and I felt like I had to include it for completeness' sake. But in truth, it was a big point of contention precisely because it was easy to see. The more in-depth and nuanced criticism was a lot harder, and would get you harassed for five years. For sixes, this is less of a retraction and more of an expansion, but I really got on Becky's case for the puberty subject, just being carte blanche to perv on Stevani. The truth is, a lot of teenage girls do get hypersexualized once they hit puberty, but that's not really a puberty thing, so much as it is a men being pervs thing. The thing that really bothered me was Becky's statement about how hitting puberty gives you the body of an adult and how it gives you power, and to put that kind of thing onto puberty and suggest that is kind of missing the forest for the trees. Being objectified doesn't give you power, it's the exact opposite of that. Then again, the quote I was taking from is highly likely to have been misspoken. Becky misspeaks more than I do, and I've actually said the phrase her pronouns are they, them multiple times in the past. My speech is fucked. I'm not an eloquent lady, and so I'm inclined to just ignore that issue today. Like, on reflection, this is small potato stuff in comparison to, like, the big picture issues. But it does raise my point about how Stevani is supposed to be non-binary, but the expression of the trials and tribulations of puberty are being done almost exclusively from a feminine perspective, when that's only half of their component. Components. The conclusion drawn there is that if you want to do a puberty episode, then just do a puberty episode. Don't do a fusion episode. Granted, this is something that improved leaps and bounds as the show went on, especially in the one episode where Stevani has facial hair, uh, which is a design element most people just wouldn't do. On reflection, with the show being done, it's clear the writers give a shit about non-binary rep. They might have sucked at it for a while, but sucking at something isn't a problem. S sucking at something can be fixed with patience. And I still maintain that Shep is fucking amazing. If we had to stumble through a minefield to get Shep, then fucking cheers. I'll drink to that, it's more visible effort than She-Ra had. See, this is what I'm talking about, the leaps and bounds between when Steven Universe is fucking brilliant and when it smashes its face against a mountain is so interesting to break down. That's what happens when you wear your inspirations on your sleeve. That's what happens when something can be practically unpacked forever if you wanted to. I have wanted to do other videos on Steven Universe, and I've always restrained myself, because there's this narrative that all I do is talk about it for hours, but like, I do want to talk about it for hours. I want to go over it with a fine-tooth comb like a fucking archaeologist. So fuck it, might as well put it out there. I do a podcast occasionally with my wife and whoever wants to talk about a given subject, usually just one of my friends. Someone who loves this show and thinks it's brilliant writing and has interesting arguments as to why, and who is 19 years of age or older, I'm offering to let you come on and do a podcast with me. Let me be clear, this is not a debate, and it is not an argument. It's not so you can complain about fake Nazi accusations. I'm inviting you to come nerd the fuck out. Come info dump to me. I've never heard a coherent argument for why this show is good, and I want to hear it. My work email is in the description. Give me one short paragraph of analysis to show me you have something interesting to talk about. Anyway, that's all I have to say for now. Thanks for watching my tirade, and I hope you have a fantastic day. Oh, Lord, just give me your heart. Oh,